And so we begin. I'm glad that you could come tonight. Um, Cassie Elton is the founder of Antelope Lending Library, about which she will tell us tonight. Cassie was a student at the University of Iowa, and she has several degrees. But in 2012, when she was here, she became affiliated with the James Gang, which you may have heard of. Um, the James Gang is an organization that is uh, formidable. It, it takes wonderful young people and their bright, creative ideas, and it's supportive of them. And with the help of the James Gang, then, Cassie was able to found Antelope Lending Library that has a very specific purpose to, I'll let her tell you what her very specific purpose is. But Cassie is a friend and, uh, and one of those formidable young people who was part of the James Gang. And we're so glad you could be here tonight, Cassie, to tell us about Antelope Lending Library, which it, it's kind of all over town. She brought her bookmobile tonight, except that Benton Street is sort of full of construction, and so she decided that was a poor idea. At any rate, Cassie, thank you for being here. Please go right ahead. Yes, thank you so much, Nancy. Um, so Nancy did a great job uh, <laughs> um, introducing me, but uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about who I am. So uh, my name is Cassie Elton. I have a master's in library in uh, <laughs> library and information science um, here from the University of Iowa. Uh, I am the library director of Antelope Lending Library, and uh, I moved here to Iowa City from New Jersey um, in 2010 to attend the university. Um, and I have to tell you that when you live on the East Coast and you move to Iowa, people do not understand. <laughs> and uh, what they don't know is that Iowa is amazing. <laughs> and I call Iowa City a hidden gem and I tell all of my friends that they should come and visit or move here. <laughs> um, I have worked in childcare on and off since I moved here. Um, I've done before and after school care in the public schools. Um, I'm currently an assistant director at Good Shepherd Center, which is just right down the hill. Um, and that is something that I enjoy very much. Maybe, let's do this. Um, so Antelope Lending Library, we are an independent, nonprofit bookmobile library. So I know that's kind of a mouthful, so we'll break it down a little bit. <laughs> so we are a library, which means that we lend items to patrons and they return them to us and we lend them out to other folks. We are independent, so that means that we are not an extension of any um, public library or school library. Um, or other type of library. Um, we are nonprofit, um, which means that all of the money that comes in goes right back out to support the mission, uh, to support our mission of overcoming barriers and providing full and equal access to information and ideas in our community. Um, our, uh, one of the pillars of our service is that all of our materials are linked on a no fees basis which means that access to our library is always free, no matter what. So if an item comes back late, damaged, or not at all, we never, ever, ever charge our patrons any money. It's totally free. So I get a lot of questions about <laughs> why does Antelope exist? Um, and uh, this is actually my, my poster that I made for library school for graduating, <laughs> um, talking about the important work that bookmobiles can do in communities in overcoming what we call invisible barriers to traditional library access. So some of those things might be transportation. If you don't have a way to get from your home to a physical library building, then that makes it very difficult <laughs> for you to use traditional library services. Um, tied in with that is geography. If you live close to a library and you don't have a vehicle, you can walk. If you don't live close enough to walk, you're too far away. You aren't able to be served by that institution. Perhaps English is not your native language, and so you don't feel comfortable trying to um, ask questions and get service in a location where people may not understand what you're asking. Uh, you may also not come from a country where there is a tradition of public libraries, and you may not know what public libraries have to offer. 
Documentation is another barrier. So many, um, actually all public libraries require um, photo, government photo ID to sign up for a library card. Traditionally you need that and then also proof of address. Um, these are things that for those of us that have our driver's license <laughs> in our pockets that has our current address, um, we don't think about that as being an issue. Of course everybody has that. Um, but there are lots of folks who don't have those documents for a wide variety of reasons. It might be immigration reasons. It might be um, that they are in a housing crisis and they don't actually have a permanent address. Um, perhaps they've had some sort of trauma in their life, a fire in their home, and those documents have been destroyed and they don't have a way to get them because to replace documents, it costs money. <laughs> And which brings me to the last barrier, money. So we think of public libraries as institutions, they are free public libraries, right? That is what, that is what they're called. But there are all kinds of hidden fees where if you return something late, if you return something damaged, if you lose an item, those fees can add up very quickly. And I want to say, I have worked for a public library. I worked for the Solo Public Library for five years. I think that public libraries are wonderful and incredible institutions. I would have not have gotten my degree in library science if I wasn't excited and passionate about libraries. But there are definitely people who are being missed with traditional public library service. So, as Nancy mentioned, um, in 2012, I joined the James Gang. Um, as an endeavor, um, which is essentially a project. And the James Gang is like a nonprofit co op where local folks gather and can support each other um, and help each other uh, take their ideas from the idea phase and make them a reality. We call it going public, take your idea public. And so when we first started in 2012, we were an all volunteer organization. All of the books in our library collection were donated from the community. Uh, luckily, we live in a UNESCO city of literature. People were incredibly generous. We got really high quality donations from the community. And um, we served one school-based tutoring program, which happened to be where I worked <laughs> um, at Grantwood Elementary at the time. And then also five parks-based summer programs um, that were um, free playground programs that the Parks and Rec Department um, puts on every year. Um, we had a budget of about $5,000 a year that was mostly from our initial fundraising. Um, and uh, we also purchased this um, second slash third hand <laughs> slash fourth hand bookmobile vehicle um, from a local bookseller in the area who bought it from a library when they retired it um, and replaced it, uh, that bookmobile, with a new one for their library. So this was, this was the beginning. And, um, I love this photo because it was taken at a Forest View uh, mobile home community, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with Forest View, um, but it actually is a community that was just recently um, uh, dissolved, for lack of a better word. And um, we, it was very heartbreaking, and so um, I like to see this picture of happier times when families were living in the community um, and engaging with each other. So that's how we started, and, um, and then we continued to grow. So in addition to our um, lending services, we added some bilingual programming and also bilingual books to our collection. So bilingual for us is English and Spanish. Um, we also started a summer sensory stop um, to serve autistic kids and their families. Um, this picture in the top right, um, so that's me in the window of the bookmobile, um, and then my friend Eleanor, um, she is my friend Heather's granddaughter and was the inspiration for the sensory stop. Um, Heather was, an, was and is an incredibly involved grandmother, and she knew that giving her granddaughter the opportunity to engage with other kids, to explore a love of reading during the summer would be incredibly important to her um, development and ability to, um, to self-soothe and to not be overwhelmed in unfamiliar situations. So um, for several years on Wednesdays in the summer, I would drive the bookmobile to Heather's house, we would park it there, and then Heather would host sensory activities all day at her home. <laughs> and she did an incredible job. She built this amazing community. 
Um, and you can see um, the picture with our new bookmobile. Um, that is Lily and Jamie. Um, Lily lived in Heather's neighborhood, um, and her family came and uh, to those sensory activities. Um, and then Lily and her friend Jamie later became youth volunteers with us at our sensory stop. Lily's family generously hosted the bookmobile at their home when Heather moved, um, not all day, but just for an hour and a half, which is a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> and, um, and it really became this wonderful community stop. Um, so we replaced our original bookmobile with a new one, which is also secondhand. Um, we bought it from the original dealer in Ohio. Um, we drove out in a snowstorm to see it, <laughs> to make sure that it would work for what we needed. We fundraised for nine months to raise enough money to bring it home, and we finally did, which was incredible. Um, uh, we expanded into year-round service, so we started just in the summer months, um, but then we were able to expand and serve all year round. And we were able to increase our budget to add purchased books to those collections. So you can see here we've got a kiddo holding elephant and piggy books. Are any of you familiar with this series? If you have grandkids, they Elephant and Piggy are like the best books. They're like the new Dr. Seuss books. Every child loves them. <laughs> and so because we now had a small budget to purchase books, we were able to buy books like Elephant and Piggy to add to our collection instead of hoping that someone would donate them to us for us to share. So then um, we got our new bookmobile, and then COVID hit, and everything changed. So. We were off the road for a couple of months while we tried to figure out how we could safely continue to serve our community. And we landed on what we called our Rome's Home Delivery Service. So you can see this is me with, uh, with my mask on and all of those books in bags are um, books that we deliver to people's houses. So it's a totally no contact delivery. Um, people sign up. Our librarians hand pick book recommendations for folks based on information they share with us. And then we deliver them to their homes uh, once a month. Uh, we also shifted our um, sensory stops to take and make creative engagement kits. So here you can see, here's one um, that uh, we sometimes we partner with other organizations to provide the activities. This summer, 4-H has partnered with us and has provided incredible take and make activities. Um, and, uh, and so that was a shift so that we could still engage with folks um, even though we couldn't gather in person. We also started supporting Little Free Libraries in the South District neighborhood. Um, and uh, what, how much do you all know about Little Free Libraries? I know that there are a couple <laughs> out here that I've seen. And, um, and so you probably know that Little Free Libraries are small bookshelves, essentially, that folks put outside and they share books. And it's take a book, leave a book. Um, and the South District, um, about 10 years ago, got a big grant to install a bunch of Little Free Libraries in the neighborhoods. Um, but the thing is, when something is outside all of the time, <laughs> um, it can start to get worn out. Um, and also with the take a book, leave a book model, there were some little free libraries where lots of people were leaving books, but not as many people were taking them. And then some neighborhoods where lots of people were taking them, but not as many people were leaving them. Um, and so we partnered with the South District Neighborhood Association to support the stewards of these little free libraries and to help them make sure that they had enough books and not too many. If anything was damaged, sometimes water would get in. We'll take out the damaged books so nobody is taking home a moldy book. Um, wasps like to live in little free libraries because they have great little peaks <laughs> inside. And so we'll let the stewards know if that's happened so that they can get that taken care of so that it's safe for everyone who's engaging with their little free library. Um, and then we also created digital story times to provide what we called story time for all. So that was something that people could watch at home at any time, right? All of that social distancing, it was a good way to reach people where they were. So now we're back on the road and we've gone from having all volunteer folks to seven part-time staff including two social workers who we just hired this year, which I'm very excited about. Um, we also have three community book drops, so folks can return their library items at any time, even if they miss us when we're in their neighborhood. Our library collection still contains donated books, 
but we have a lot more books that we've been able to purchase based on requests from folks in the community. Uh, we serve three child care centers, two parks, five neighborhoods, and one community center. You may be familiar with Open Heartland that's over on Benton Street. Um, we visit them every week and do programming and book checkout. We also continue to support uh, 35 Little Free Libraries. And we've continued our Rome's deliveries, which was not something that we were expecting. We thought that once um, things sort of opened back up again and we were back on the road, um, that we would just sort of return to how things were before. Um, but we found that the demand for our Rome's deliveries has remained consistent. And so that's a service that we have continued to provide. Um, and we've increased from having a budget of about $5,000 a year to having a budget of about $101,000 a year, which is really great. Um, but as you know, nonprofit budgets are sort of pretend. <laughs> and this is an aspirational budget, and we work towards that, and so far we're doing pretty great. <laughs> so we have two sort of um, areas of service. So the first one is our bookmobile services. So these are our neighborhood and nonprofit bookmobile stops. This is when we drive our library into neighborhoods or to a location and open our doors and people can come on and check out library books, do activities. Um, during the summer, we have snacks through a partnership with the Iowa City Community School District. Um, so folks can come get a snack. Um, we also provide programming. Um, so something that a lot of folks miss when they live far away from downtown um, is a lot of the like festivals <laughs> and exciting workshops and things that happen in Iowa City tend to happen downtown. Um, and so we like to bring programming out into the neighborhoods to meet people where they are. So you can see down here, this is um, a hip hop and break dance workshop <laughs> um, that we coordinated with um, one of the admin at the University of Iowa, who is also a published author. Um, and so he and his friends came and did some break dancing and some street art um, with the kids um, up at Breckenridge Estates. Um, we also had um, an instructor come and talk about comics and drawing. Um, we had a musician and a band come and have sort of um, a musical uh, petting zoo <laughs> so the kids could explore with different kinds of instruments that they may never have even heard of before. Um, and then of course we have book checkout as well. Then we have what we're calling our outreach services. So lots of libraries call bookmobile service outreach, but since our bookmobile is our library, <laughs> we call outreach anything we do without the bookmobile. So our Rome's Home Delivery Service is a great example of that. Um, this year already, from January to July, we've delivered over 1,500 books to almost 560 readers, um, and those are monthly deliveries um, to households all over Johnson County. We've also continued our monthly creative engagement kits, and we share those with our Rome's families um, in Little Free Libraries, on our bookmobile, um, and we drop some off at centers where people gather as well so they can pick them up um, throughout the month. We've continued our Little Free Library steward support. Um, folks have been really receptive and grateful for that additional help. Um, sometimes folks buy a house that has a Little Free Library, and they don't really know what that means <laughs> or what that responsibility is. So they're really glad to have someone help them navigate that. Um, and we've also expanded into what we are calling lobby libraries. So this is the same idea as a little free library, but it is inside um, a center like, uh, uh, like Shelter House um, or 501 Plus or Cross Park Place, um, where, the, where the books live inside a facility as opposed to outside on the street. Um, and those are really wonderful because we can also help kind of curate the donated books that we bring there to reflect the interests of the folks who are taking advantage of those services. Um, and then we also have partnerships with the Coralville Public Library. So here you can see some of the, um, the Coralville Public Library whoop, librarians um, standing there where they accept returns for us um, at Antelope to make it easier for people to get books back to us. And we also contract with them um, to expand their reach in Coralville um, into some of the communities that are kind of on the cusp of Coralville and aren't being reached by traditional library services. 
Um, and then our partnership with the Iowa City Community School District for the summer. We're part of their free summer snacks program. Um, and one of our staff also works at West High in their library. Um, and the school district has approved anyone returning our library books to any of the school libraries in the Iowa City School District. And then they send them through the inner office mail to West High to, to Miss Tina. <laughs> and then she brings them back to our bookmobile. So it's really been wonderful to see um, and receive the support of, in so many different areas of our community um, to support this work. I keep bumping that button, I think. Um, so these are just some of our partners and collaborators. Um, so these are folks that either we partner with to support both of our missions, um, perhaps they have supported us with funding. Um, many of the local bookstores, so Prairie Lights, Daydreams Comics, The Haunted Bookshop, and Psychic Coffee and Books. They give us a discount on books that we purchase from them, um, and a couple of them. Uh, Daydreams also sells um, little merchandise on our behalf, where all of the funding goes towards us, and we basically just use it to buy more comics from them, because those are very popular. <laughs> um, we got a grant um, the last couple of years from the National Endowment for the Arts to support some of that programming that I was talking about, the musicians that have come in, the break dancing, um, all of that. And, um, and then we also have had folks like the Lena Project right along with us to provide educational, environmental, um, and fun programming with the people that we serve. So um, people always ask me when they find out that we're not part of a larger institution, they say, well, where does the money come from? <laughs> so uh, you can see the breakdown here. Most of the money um, at this point comes from grants. So um, we just recently have received a very generous grant from the Johnson County Quality of Life, which we are incredibly excited about. Um, they classified us as an essential service in Johnson County, which feels absolutely wonderful, <laughs> and the support that comes with it makes this work possible. Um, we've also gotten grants from the Network for, of the National Library of Medicine, the Iowa Arts Council, American Library Association, Community Foundation of Johnson County, and All These Smart Kids, as well as many others. Um, we also have a contract. So I mentioned we've contracted with the Coralville Public Library to expand their reach within Coralville. We partner with Good Shepherd Center, um, Child Care Center, where we do weekly story times um, for their kiddos. And then uh, I've also facilitated book mending workshops um, for different libraries and also for the city of Iowa City um, as an additional way um, to bring money in for Antelope and um, share skills with the community. We do, we do some fundraising. Um, we do seasonal book sales, in fact, um, in September. So next month, we have our Back to the Classroom sale, where any educators at all, early childhood, all the way up um, to high school or college can come, and for $5, they can take as many books as they would like to fill their classroom libraries. Um, if you're not an educator, you can also still come and shop. Books are priced from 50 cents to $2, or you can buy an antelope tote bag for 25 and fill it with as many books as you want. Um, we also have some antelope merchandise. We just got t-shirts recently um, in collaboration with Rayan that says, I was wearing it in the slide in the front that says, my favorite library has a steering wheel. <laughs> um, and then we also do bookmobile birthday parties, which is very fun. Um, we come and we do uh, sort of like mini story times and activities. The kids get a chance to sit in the driver's seat of the bookmobile. Um, and they are just incredibly fun for little bookworms. Um, and then lastly, of course, last but not least, we have donations. So just individual donations from people like you, um, either one-time donations or annual donations. We also have a group of sustaining members, which are folks that donate a certain amount of money every month towards the work that we do. Um, sustaining members are one of the most important ways that we get donations because um, it is a regular amount of money that we can rely on. And, um, and it makes it really easy for folks to give a large amount of money over time that would be more than they could give in one lump sum. So I'm a monthly donor, and I know that I can give a lot more that way than just writing a check. Um, so then, once people know where the money comes from, they want to know where the money goes. 
So um, we are a small organization, but we do have seven part-time staff. So unsurprisingly, most of the money goes to pay all of the people that make this service possible. Um, the next big chunk is goes towards programming and supplies. So that includes community partners. Whenever we get a grant to provide programming, we always include money to pay the people that are coming to share their talents with us. Um, we know that that's an incredibly important part of sustainability, especially in the arts community. And so we always want um, to compensate people for their time and expertise when at all possible. Um, it also goes to purchase activity materials. Um, and that includes uh, activities that we do on the bookmobile, and then also materials that we send out in our creative engagement kits into the community. Uh, we also have uh, um, uh, um, expenses like office space, um, dues and memberships. So we are, we continue to be a part of the James Gang. It has been an incredibly helpful and supportive organization for us to be a part of. And there's a small um, amount of dues that we pay every year to benefit from that community. Um, we offer free Wi-Fi on the bookmobile, so we have to pay for that cost. Um, collection development is a surprisingly small piece of the pie, in part because we get so many generous donations from our community. Um, but, uh, but also we have added uh, things like games to our collection, so we're not just circulating books anymore. We have board games and card games that folks can check out to play with their families at home. And then, of course, we have our vehicle. So just like any vehicle, um, it needs maintenance, it needs repairs, um, we have to pay for gas, um, and then also registration of the vehicle so that we can be legally on the road. <laughs> All right, so that's my presentation. So this is my information here if you've got any questions. Um, this is our official address um, where folks can send um, donations or anything, and then this is our website where you can find out more information. And I want to open it up for any questions that people have. Yeah, Gary. Cassie, do you, do you have any, uh, either now or in the past, any collaboration with the Children's Museum? Oh, that is such a great question. Thank you, Gary, yes. So every fall, we are at their big Move It, Dig It, Do It event. I don't know if any of you have been. It's incredibly fun. <laughs> they bring all of these giant vehicles into the parking lot outside the Children's Museum in Corvo. And they have big cement mixers and cranes and fire trucks and city buses and our bookmobile. Um, and so people get to come through, kids get to sit in the driver's seat. We let them honk the horn. Whoever is near us hates that we let them honk the horn, but they just, it's so much fun. <laughs> um, and then we have also had them come along with us into the neighborhoods before um, for end of summer parties. And they bring their giant blue blocks and the kids get to build these huge structures and it is very fun. Yeah, thanks. I have a question, Cassie. Uh, you said you still have a relationship with the James Gang. Yeah. Uh, what, how does that work? What, what do you do for one another? Yeah, that's a great question, Nancy. So, um, like I mentioned, the James Gang is like a nonprofit co-op, um, and um, and so one of the most difficult things about starting a nonprofit is um, filing for nonprofit status. Um, figuring out how to do your taxes and file those so that you can keep your nonprofit status, <laughs> figuring out what kind of insurance you need to operate safely, um, and also um, being able to have access to a lawyer when like weird things come up and you have questions about contracts or different things. Um, and so all of those are things that the James Gang offers its members. So we don't have to figure we don't have to figure these things out on our own. Um, and, uh, and so in addition to all of those sort of logistical things, it also brings all of these really great, motivated, creative, thoughtful people into the same space at the same time. And so we can all pick each other's brains and, um, and support each other. Um, the Lena Project, who I mentioned earlier, is also part of the James Gang. Um, another endeavor we partner with is Iowa City Poetry. Um, uh, PS1. PS1 uh, started as a part of the James Gang. Um, uh, Mission Creek Festival started as part of the James Gang. Um, there are a lot of really amazing things that still happen in this community that started with the James Gang. And we're actually celebrating 21 years this year, which is really wild to think about. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. 
I'm assuming that the James Gang is not the one founded by Frank and Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> but if you Google the James Gang, that band does come up. <laughs> Do you have any concerns about um, censorship or you know the 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 state regulations now for pub, for school and public libraries? Yes, thank you so much for bringing that up. So the, the censorship legislation that has been attempted to be pushed through and things that are getting pushed through is incredibly concerning and I think it should be for all of us who value education and who value intellectual freedom. Um, one of the benefits that we have of being an independent nonprofit library is that we are not subject to those same kinds of rules and regulations that government agencies and school libraries are. Um, and so, uh, in fact, we were at the Pride Parade this summer, and one of the things that we handed out was flyers about books that are banned that you can check out at our library. Um, and so that is something that we are very much aware of. Um, we also advocate <laughs> against censorship. We don't think that um, books should be censored. Um, but in the climate that we have, we are really grateful that we're able to be in a position where we can provide freedom to read to everyone. Yeah. Any other questions? I can't believe that I have never seen your bus <laughs> or heard of you. And I have a 10-year-old granddaughter, and she loves the library. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure she would love to come visit. So how do we find you? I am so glad that you asked. So I brought our summer schedule here today. Um, I was hoping to bring the bookmobile, but with all of the construction, I got nervous that it would be too difficult. <laughs> um, but you can come see us in action at the Diversity Market in the South District um, on Saturday between 3 and 7 p.m. Um, we have seasonal schedules um, that change, but, um, but our uh, website is always updated with where we are. Um, you mentioned that you are surprised that you haven't seen us, and I will say um, that the main reason for that is probably because a lot of the communities that we serve are sort of hidden in our community. So we visit a lot of mobile home parks, um, and when I start to list them off, a lot of folks have never heard of them or even known that there was a whole neighborhood um, there. So, uh, for example, we visit Breckenridge Estates. It's out in the county, but it is part of the Iowa City School District. Buses don't go out there. <laughs> it's kind of on your way to West Liberty um, is where this community is. Um, and, uh, and so that's a neighborhood where a lot of folks don't go often and you really don't have a reason to turn down Taft Avenue unless you're going there. Um, we also um, have a stop at the Haycap Waterfront office, which is right next to Shelter House. Um, it's across the street from Hilltop Mobile Homes. Um, we used to park right inside um, Hilltop so you couldn't even see us from the street. Um, now that we're at the Haycap parking lot, you can see us if you're driving on, um, on that street. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, <laughs> we are sort of hidden in plain sight, just like a lot of these other communities that we serve are. Also, the name of uh, your library um, might leave people wondering a little bit, too, I think. Sure. Yeah, so Antelope Lending Library, the name came about while I was in library school. Um, and we read an essay called, What is a Document? And it was sort of this intellectual exercise of what kinds of materials belong in a library. So it, you know, is a book a document? Is a single sheet of paper a document? Is an MP3 a document? Um, and uh, is an antelope a document? If you, if you collect it and you label it and you put it in your, in your space, that people can visit it and observe it and interact with it, does that make it a document in your library? And, uh, and so it sparked this big debate where some people said, of course, you know, anything belongs in a library. And other people said, absolutely not. My library is not a zoo. <laughs> Antelopes have no place there. Um, and so uh, when, we, when we put together this bookmobile library, we thought, well, the antelope is the perfect mascot because it's asking you know, what belongs in a library, but also where does a library belong? And where can a library go? And what does a library look like? So that's where antelope came from. I, I kind of thought, I'm wondering. <laughs> yes, thank you for asking. So I can't borrow an antelope? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we have tiny, stuffy antelopes <laughs> that you can borrow, but not a live antelope. <laughs> hey, Ron. You recognized me. I did. I'm so glad you made it. <laughs> a, long, a long time ago, uh, you parked your brand new bookmobile in front of the uh, State Capitol building yes. and received an award. Uh, you might say what that was for, but and, and then I have a comment too. Uh, sure. The antelope, as you just said, the antelope uh, lending library goes to comfortable places. There's nothing against the bookmobile for the Iowa uh, City Community Library, but but I'm sorry. That goes to comfortable places. This goes to, as you say, places that you don't normally go to. And it's, it does a tremendous service for those people. Thank you, Ron. I really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, Ron, uh, Ron is mentioning, so in 2016, we received the Iowa Literacy Award, um, which is a, a statewide award that people nominate um, um, organizations or individuals that they feel like have really positively and greatly impacted the literacy community in the state. Um, and we were incredibly honored to be unanimously um, voted to receive this award. Um, and so we were able to drive our bookmobile out to Des Moines. Um, it, it caps out at 55 miles an hour, so it was a long drive. <laughs> and it was in the fall, and the bookmobile also does not have heat or cooling when it is driving, only when it's parked. So we brought lots of blankets, <laughs> um, and it was just an incredible experience to be at the Capitol um, with our vehicle and receive that recognition for all of the hard work um, that we were doing. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. How do you handle uh, receiving donations? Oh, excellent question. Um, so we have many ways that we can receive donations. Um, sometimes people will bring them to us when we are out on the road with our bookmobile, um, which is great as long as it's like one box. <laughs> um, we also, through our road service, we can coordinate a pickup from your house um, of books, or we can coordinate a drop-off of books at our um, book garage, which is also my garage <laughs> at my house. <laughs> Yeah. If you were if you were to leave here with one thought in mind, what's your greatest need right now? Um, as a small nonprofit, honestly, our greatest need is always money. It's always funding. That is the most flexible type of donation that we can receive. Um, we get discounts on books. We receive incredibly generous donations of books, um, and those are all great and important. Um, but it's really the people um, in our organization that make the work that we do so impactful um, and so incredible. And, um, and without the funding to support people like that, um, you get a lot of turnover and you don't get a lot of consistency. Um, one of the things that I am most proud of um, is that since we have started um, having a paid staff, we have only had one person leave our team, and when she did, she cried because her work schedule changed at the school where she was working, and she so badly wanted to continue to work with us that it just didn't work in her schedule anymore. Um, and so I like to think that we take really good care of our people. Um, we also do our best to take really good care of our vehicle. Um, because of a lot of the outreach programming we've been doing, the vehicle, we don't always have to have the vehicle, but that's where our library lives. So it is pretty important that the air conditioner continues to work, that the drivetrain <laughs> is staying stable, um, that the tires are in good condition, right? All of those things that you want with your own vehicle, but it is so much larger. I want to add to, to what Ron said about going to those uncomfortable places. Um, I, I've, I've observed you working with, uh, particularly with Open Heartland, which is an organization that welcomes immigrants to the community. Uh, in a literacy program during the summertime where um, you come and you read both in Spanish and in English and bring a community out into uh, big, out to be together as well as offering something to the children and it, it's a wonderful thing that you do to bring that community together and, and to offer what you do and at no cost and to go to them because they can't necessarily go to where they would get that service otherwise and so 
Thank you very much. And unless there's another question. I think there's one more over here. Oh, I have one. Oh, a couple. Great. So, so do you have books for adults also? or um, Yes. Yes, absolutely. So we have board books all the way up to adult fiction and nonfiction. Um, because a lot of um, our staff experience up until recently has been with youth and youth education, that's a lot of what we get excited about. <laughs> um, but we absolutely have books for adults as well. Um, and uh, we actually had a patron come on the other day at one of our neighborhood stops where um, she picked a book off the shelf. She was so excited to read it. And then she saw that we had the same title in Spanish as well. And she got so excited. And she said, my husband has never read this book because we don't have it in Spanish. But now we have it in Spanish and we can read the book together. And it was just really so wonderful. It was the same question. It was the same question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, if there, there are no other, if there are no other questions, then Cassie, thank you very much for coming tonight and telling us about Antelope Library, which does so much for our community. Bless you. We appreciate you. Oh, Thanks thank so you much. so much, Nancy. Thank you.